we'll just have to wing it. Um, sorry, we'll improvise. Um, my name is Leonard Isakowitz. I am a retired consultant ophthalmologist and a member of council. Nicholas, Nicholas. And um, it's um, my good fortune to welcome you here tonight and to chair the meeting. And um, I just have a housekeeping type things which the uh, regulars will be used to, but um, could you please turn mobiles and pages off unless you desperately need it because you're on call? Um, the fire exits, uh, which I just discovered, are on this side and this side, and I believe you can get out at the back um, quicker here. Um, when um, we've changed the running order very slightly, we used to have a five minutes break between the, the talk and questions, Q&A, but we're trying to reduce that a little so there'll just be enough time for the council members to collect the microphones to wander around and ask your questions. And there are also uh, questions from people. There are a few people on Zoom by special request. And um, so um, Gerent, who will be here somewhere, there he is at the back, um, will be feeding those questions to me. Um, there will be no uh, practice fire alarms. So if you hear one, scoot. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, both of us are retired now, Professor Gordon Dutton, who um, until recently was a consultant ophthalmologist in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. Um, going back a bit, he trained, he just told me now, uh, he's from Chester and um, he went to school in Chester at a school that was inaugurated, I think, by Henry VIII, is that right? So um, uh, he knows exactly what to do um, if he gets any uh, difficult issues. Um, he, studied he studied medicine at the University of Bristol. We also started training in ophthalmology, um, which was a longer uh, road than it is nowadays. Um, it was over seven years just to become an ophthalmologist. It's a little less now, and uh, people often do um, a year of subspecialty um, because ophthalmology, like many fields, are becoming a field of subspecialists. Um, he then trained in Glasgow. He was the senior lecturer in the Tennant Institute of Ophthalmology and eventually became a consultant. Um, he worked at um, York Hill for many years. And during that time, he specialized in um, children whose vision was disturbed by their neurological problems. And we realized at that time that this was becoming a far more uh, common problem because of the success of the neonatologists in keeping little babies alive, premature babies. Besides um, his expertise in this, which he says has actually been as much of a hobby as his other interests, um, I would describe him, he might describe this as a polymath. So I'm only going to give you a brief a description of his interests, but he is a very keen gardener. Um, he does, he describes it as carpentry, but I think it's more cabinet making because he's meticulous in what he does and his family. So with that brief introduction, Gordon Dutton. So thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I've had the privilege of working with many hundred people who have had their own individual unique visual difficulties 
as a result of brain injury. And assembling all this information over the years has been a particular hobby. So my talk, as you can see, is entitled The Impact of Brain Injury Upon Vision. What can this teach us about how our minds see? And a few examples. What I am going to do is to show you a few videos made by friends um, th through this talk, uh, which show that this is really very much a team effort. Whether it is the beauty of a sunset or a famous landmark, we can, with our vision, appreciate and understand and also guide our movement through the world. And these are two distinct, separate visual tasks. Yet, how do our minds achieve this remarkable phenomenon? Today, I want to focus on how we can use the, how vision can be understood in part by the impact of some examples of focal, that means specific and local brain injury affecting elements of the brain's visual system. Practically everybody in this audience will be fully aware that um, the eye is a camera, a little room, a space in which the picture is cast upon the back of the eye through the optics of the front of the eye, the clear watch glass of the cornea, the small smarty shaped and sized lens behind upon the surface of the retina, which acts as the amazing film in our camera. As an ophthalmologist, when we look into the eye, we see the nerve at the back, the optic nerve, the blood vessels, the darker ones being venous blood, the thinner bright ones, uh, lighter ones being uh, our small arterioles, and the area in the center, um, with, which is in this area, which is where we have our central vision, and then all the way around in the dome of the eye to the extent that I can see my finger here, just behind myself, because the light is coming in to my peripheral retina. And therefore, we have a big field of vision. When you look at this picture, I wonder how many people see a bird. Would you put your hand up if you see a bird? Well, actually, it's a rabbit. Look again. Now, the reason I show that is that this gives us a little insight into how our minds are seeing. Our minds see by comparison with a vast library of visual information uh, inside. And it is through this means uh, that we, you, um, hypothesized. I mean, everything we see is a hypothesis of mind. You hypothesized that it might have been a bird, but as you can now see, it is truly a rabbit. When you look at this, take your finger and sight those two dark lines. They look as if they're different in length, but go like that, sight it, and then move to the other side, and you will see that they are exactly the same length. This shows us that what is reality is not what we see. What is rea our reality is what we perceive and construct from our prior knowledge. Here, the prior knowledge of what constitutes depth. In this picture, it looks quite reasonable, doesn't it? Because the mouth is the right way up. The eyes are the right way up, but the face is upside down. But what happens when we invert it? And this relates to the fact that when people are looking at a picture of a face and their eye movements are being recorded, those eye movements move from eye to eye, briefly to mouth, and a quick gaze round the perimeter. And so with our central vision, our analytical central vision, we are predestined to spend time looking at eyes just as the newborn infant does to its mother. More of that later. 
this film is going to show you a story. And here we go. Kia ora. My name is Nicola McDowell. As a teenager, I found schoolwork easy. I had loads of friends and was really good at sports, particularly netball and swimming. I won age group national swimming titles and was aiming to represent New Zealand at the 2000 Sydney Olympics. I was living the dream. Then one day when I was 16, something happened. I have no memory of the events, but friends have filled in the gaps. Apparently, I was training in the pool and started complaining of not feeling well. Firstly, of a headache, then spots in front of my eyes, followed by dizziness and numbness in my fingers and toes, and then an extreme sense of coldness in my whole body. When my dad came to pick me up from the training, he found me unconscious by the poolside, receiving emergency medical attention. My lips were blue and I had stopped breathing. At the back of my brain and my left occipital lobe, an artery had started bleeding. My friends were witnessing what happens when a part of the brain is suddenly starved of oxygen. Due to a number of extraordinary strokes of luck, I survived. It seemed the only effect was that I could no longer see on my right side. So if this is what someone with typical vision sees, this is what I see. Apart from it's all I see, so not on the left, but in the middle. And yes, I have gone out only brushing one side of my hair. But for something I have been assured by many really should have killed me, to have left me just with the loss of vision in one side seems like I got away pretty lightly. I hadn't. An invisible enemy had infected my brain. Schoolwork was more difficult. I couldn't concentrate. Things didn't make sense, and I didn't know why. I couldn't follow the teacher, and my grades started falling. I managed to offend just about everyone without knowing why and what I was doing wrong, and went from social butterfly to social outcast. Increasingly, I hid away from the world. As expected, I became very low. Unaware of my invisible enemy, I just accepted it was all me. Somehow I made it through college, deciding on teaching as a career. I was naturally drawn to working with children with visual impairments, initially specialising in orientation mobility, and then as a specialist teacher, or TVI. One day, at a conference for work, I was listening to Professor Gordon Dutton explaining a visual impairment from the brain. Incredibly, I realised he was explaining me. But how could this stranger describe my whole world without ever having met me? At the end of the talk, I went up to Professor Dutton and nervously said, I think I have what you just described. He was describing cerebral visual impairment. As I learnt more, everything started to make sense. Knowing CVI was the cause meant I was able to start working on life-changing, life-affirming, life-empowering solutions. CVI stopped being my invisible enemy and became a part of me, a part of who I am. Not an infestation, just something that needs thought, planning, care and attention. I was still working with children with visual impairments, and like everyone in vision, seeing more and more children with CVI added to our caseloads. Talking to their parents, I recognised myself and many of their children, who were often confused, struggling with school and friendships, as I did, and blaming themselves, like there must be something wrong with them. So as you probably guessed, I missed the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, but I have a new dream, a bigger dream, a better dream. My dream is to help the CVI community I'm so proud to be a part of. I've met and worked with the most amazing people, particularly others affected by CVI. So that's me. I never thought I would say this again, but I'm still living the dream with CVI. Um, so what happened to her was she had a bleed from an arteriovenous malformation into her left back of the brain called the occipital lobes. If you were to take your hands, I'm going to do it, and place my hands over my ears, um, my palms are over uh, my temporal lobes. My fingers are over my posterior parietal lobes. And my thumbs overlie my occipital lobes. And it is the occipital lobes that receive the visual information. And we know this from the work of Gordon Holmes in 1918, who plotted the nature of the parts of the brain, which parts of the brain saw what, because of the design of British helmets, which allowed shrapnel to go into the visual brain, but not the German helmets. Um, so the work was all British. 
and, and sadly, and the bits, the shrapnel positions and shapes enabled Gordon Holmes to produce this remarkably accurate diagram in which, as you can see at the back of the brain here, uh, the uh, image um, is served for the center. And I've seen a young man in Taiwan uh, who had a motorbike accident where he suddenly stopped and his brain inside his head went back forwards and backwards and bruised the very tip at the back. And so he lost his central vision because that well, was what was injured. So as you can see, the brain maps vision perfectly, identically for each eye, so that a target up there will be seen in the same part of both eyes, but it goes to the same brain cell in the occipital lobes. Remarkable. And Gordon Holmes was the first, uh, not the very first, uh, there was Emato also did it in the Sino-Japanese War, um, but Holmes did it more in more detail uh, to show how the brain is perfectly representing external visual space. So how much brain is responsible for seeing? Well, Gordon Holmes argued that it was just the blue bit at the back. The signal from the eyes comes into a relay station known as the lateral geniculate or knee-shaped body. And then it comes to the back of the brain to the occipital lobes. But actually it's much more than that. The vision-related brain comprises around 40% of cerebral tissue at a conservative estimate, 40% of your whole brain being devoted to the creation of the imagery around us, integrating with all the other senses. Let me give, talk about the case of a 50-year-old newspaper editor who suddenly collapsed and when he woke up uh, about 10 minutes later, um, he was unable to see in the top left area of his vision. Gosh, if everything can go wrong, everything can go wrong. The next slide is now not playing as I'm, I'm sorry, that one, that one. Um, in the next slide, you would see, uh, I don't know if you need help now, um, in the next slide, you would see, thank you, in the, I, I shall project a bit more as well, in the next slide, you will see uh, that, um, or would see if you could see it, that the imagery in the top left hand quarter comes down and enters the brain and creates um, a picture in the bottom left-hand corner of your brain. And it's true for every one of the four quadrants is represented. So in essence, on the back of the brain, when I look, how do I use the microphone and turn around? Um, I should project further. At the back of the brain, when one is looking down here, the top right hand quarter sees in both eyes. And it's exactly in this representation. Now, moving on to the next slide, which I do not show you, can I show you at the moment? Um, it's a picture of this gentleman's brain. The problem is that he has developed um, a stroke of his right temporal lobe and the visual pathway has gone through in a loop through the right temporal lobe and so we know that if you can't see up here from Gordon Holmes's work and other work we know that you cannot see in the um, top left hand quarter from the temporal lobe but the other thing that this man had was an inability to recognize faces Prosopos is Greek for face, A is not to know, and gnosis is knowledge. And so it's not to have knowledge of faces, it's prosopagnosia. He had developed prosopagnosia as a consequence of this stroke. He then uh, also found that he couldn't find his way about. He had arrived in the clinic with his wife, and his wife 
uh, when I asked the question, do you have any difficulty finding a way about? He said, no, I don't have any difficulty. And his wife said, oh, you do. You have great difficulty. I took you in to work the other day and you walked straight into the sweetie shop. Um, so that is called topos, a shape or knowledge of space. Um, and so he had topographic agnosia as well. Have you ever recognized that you yourselves do not know um, when, when you see somebody, oh, thank you. I don't know what you did there. Um, when, when you see somebody's face, um, you, you sometimes don't recognize them if they're in the wrong place. Um, and that is because places and faces are filed in your right temporal lobe, in nearly everybody's right temporal lobe, but sometimes the left, um, together. So now I can show you the pictures. Let's see if it works. Oh, it does now. Thank you, Leonard. Um, so scans, the right is on the left, the left is on the right. So the right brain has had a stroke in the temporal lobe and uh, this is how he could not recognize faces because this is the part of the brain that recognizes faces and he also lost his way. But now I'm hoping, but there is no sound. The last thing I remember is lying here in my own bed. And I, I vaguely remember being taken to the hospital. And then after that, I don't remember anything. When I woke up, it was completely black. Absolutely black. When Melina Channing was 29 years old, she was left blind by a stroke. My eyes are perfect, but it's the damage that the stroke did to my brain. It had completely decimated her primary visual cortex that area at the back of the brain that processes all the information from your eyes. But then, a little while later... I was giving Stephanie a bath and, you know, running the tap, running the water. I see the water moving. But then they went and told all the doctors. They said um, it's, it's her imagination. And then I started seeing... Um, the rain coming down from the sky, the windscreen wipers on, the steam coming from my coffee cup. And though she couldn't see her daughter? I would see her ponytail moving left to right. It seemed to be things that were moving, but nobody believed me. She visited neurologists in Canada who showed her this weird shifting grid. And I actually, started crying because I could see it. It turns out there are these modules in the brain that are specialized for processing higher order aspects of vision, like recognizing faces or letters or motion. And it seemed that in Melina's brain, the information coming through the eyes had found a way to bypass that broken primary visual cortex and still get out to that motion module a part of her brain that was apparently still intact. It's just amazing what I can see. I can avoid obstacles and fill the kettle. I'm seeing colours better, but I can't see people. I don't see your face. I mean, you're there, but I just see the shadow. That compartmental nature of vision that may have been her blessing is also proving to be a quiet curse. Just now and again, it hits me, you know, why can't I see my daughter's face and who does she look like? And it's so frustrating. And then I think about it for a while and then I think, oh well, at least I'm here.
So as a sequel, um, so in essence, um, I saw her and then read this wonderful book, which I commend to you. You have to read it about three times to understand it, but it's a really good book um, about sight unseen, which is an exploration of conscious and unconscious vision in which the patient, their patient, DF, who could not consciously see form, yet could move accurately and freely through space. And so I referred her to a team uh, in London, Ontario, who'd written this book. Um, and when she viewed that moving map, um, what happened was these little orange parts of her brain lit up. The bit which had been discovered that when destroyed by strokes on both sides, leads to selective disturbance of motion vision. And Zill, von Kremen and Mai were the first people to describe this in 1983 um, as a specific entity. And they coined the term akinetopsia, an inability to see anything that moves. I've now seen many people with dyskinetopsia, difficulty seeing fast movement, but being not being able to, but a being able to see slower movement. And now here she is accurately uh, reaching for moving balls. Now, I would love to show you the video. Um, and so let's see what happens. It should start in a moment. Um, uh, and if it does, we'll be able to see, because I was told it was reconfigured to start seeing the movement. Um, so here, we, what is remarkable is that she is able to um, move and reach for moving balls accurately. And in the script, she said, she gets a, she's viewing big, she's catching bigger balls and little balls. And in the script, she actually says, Oh, that's the weird one. Oh, here we are. There we are, big one. And now when this next ball comes, watch this. That's a big ball. And now the next one's a little one. And she says, oh, that's the weird one. But I didn't know that until I caught it. Um, so that was remarkable, showing that she can move freely without even knowing how it happens. When I first met Melina, she gave the story you've just heard. And I said to her, I'd like you to walk around these three chairs in figure of eight fashion. And she said, I don't think I can do that. And I said, I think you can. Have a go. And she did. She walked perfectly around those chairs at this sort of pace, um, perfectly able to go around them in figure of eight fashion. Um, and she said, I didn't know I can do that because I was aware from this literature that despite having no visual brain whatsoever, according to Gordon Holmes, she was able to move through the world she could not see accurately. So the obvious thing to prescribe for her was a rocking chair. And that's what I did so that she could start to learn to see as she moved within her lounge. And so as she rocked, she could see. As she stopped rocking, everything disappeared. Gradually, however, she gained the ability to be able to see without having to rock. And then, miracle of miracles. I'd read in the book, Sight Unseen, that it's possible to move your finger around the letters you can't see, like an E or an L. And she, so she later learned to read by outlining each letter that she could not see using her forefinger. And then she learned to imagine doing this, or imagine pantomiming is also described in the book Sight Unseen. She became able to read headlines despite not having what was considered by Gordon Holmes to have a visual brain at all. So how do we, answer, how do we explain this? Um, we explain it by the fact that um, 
the the way our brains work is when I put got you to put your hands like this, I was explaining that we have a visual cortex at the back, which does the primary processing of the incoming signal. And then the signal is split into two dimensions. One goes into the temporal lobes, um, and which is where the library of everything we have ever seen is filed. That's what we have. We have a complete wonderful library. But it also goes up to the top, to the parietal lobes, which is where we create a map in relation to our bodies that enables us to freely move through the world. The lower stream, when a body is lying on the anatomical table, this is on the back. And so the green stream or the vision for action pathway is known as the dorsal stream. And the blue stream, which is the vision for perception and recognition pathway, is the ventral stream. But she'd lost her visual cortex. She'd lost her ventral stream. But the parietal lobe was OK. And so was the movement detection center. And so what this shows us brilliantly and has been published in 2019 uh, in great detail after about 17 years of research um, on this one lady, what this shows is that the, uh, our brains are dichotomized into two separate distinct uh, entities, one for recognition and the other that enables you to run up a flight of stairs. I didn't actually judge it. My parietal lobes did it for me without even thinking about it. And it does it for you too. So what about the antithesis when vision for action is not working so well? During the First World War, Gordon Holmes was a busy man. He also described six further soldiers whose posterior parietal lobe pathways on both sides have been severely injured by shrapnel. So this is the other way around, but their temporal lobes are intact. They could see, see clearly and recognize what they're looking at. But what they, although they retained good clarity of vision and good 3D vision, they'd lost much of their lower vision. They could only give attention to one or two things at once, and they could not use their vision to guide their movements. And so, and they also had lower visual field impairment, as, as you could see uh, in this image, which is the lack of vision down below is that black area in the upper diagrams. And that is um, where, so where the sh shrapnel had gone through the brain. And so that you can see, if you look at the lower field, it's going through the posterior parietal lobes with that looping up of the, uh, of the visual pathway into the posterior parietal lobes. Whoops. Oh gosh, didn't mean to do that. Um, so now, in fact, this condition had also been discovered in 1909 by Berlint, who first described how strokes at the back of the brain in a patient led to the same set of visual difficulties. Um, comprising, he described Balint syndrome, comprising inaccurate visual guidance of movement, inability to see more than one or two things at once, and inability to move both eyes to look at a nominated target. When three-year-old Chris developed a heart valve infection, this led to bleeding into his brain because the infection had got into the arteries of the brain. We first saw him with visual difficulties 10 years later, People hadn't realized what his problems were for seven years. But brain imaging showed severe damage to both posterior parietal lobes. And his visual behaviors matched those of Berlin syndrome. He was the first child with this condition to be described, to my knowledge. And as a young child, he was hesitant on stairs. He probed the ground with his foot. He would lie on the ground watching TV upside down to use his upper visual field to watch TV upside down. 
He would go down uh, the slides on his tummy to use his upper visual field to do that. He would move a plate away to be able to eat, and he would hold up books high up to use his upper visual field. He, when little, he liked to play with toys on the kitchen um, cabinets because, again, they were up high. All these behaviours were his natural adaptations not to being able to see down below. He would not jump off a bench. He would not jump into a swimming pool. He became angry when a low table was moved and had difficulty walking on uneven ground, often refusing to cross floor boundaries and refusing to play games with low balls like hockey. Because these are all natural reactions to not seeing down below. Also, nothing that was dropped was ever picked up. His food was left on the near side of the plate, while his shoes on the floor were missed and constantly getting scuffed. He could reach out accurately above eye level, but was clumsy when reaching down below eye level for obvious reasons. And these behaviors are also the natural outcomes of lack or low quality of vision down below. He got close to screens despite good vision and normal optics in order to singular focus on single elements. He would sometimes listen, I can't see it, you can see, no, you can't see the script either. Um, listen to, to, by sitting on the floor behind people like this, while also looking away during conversations because he couldn't encompass somebody's face and listen at the same time because that was too much mental processing for him. Do you know people that look away from your face when they're listening to you? He disliked patterns and preferred plain ones instead. He also sometimes liked to line up his toys. Why? Not because he was autistic, but because he could find them again. He could not find a friend in a group, nor find a toy in a toy box, nor find an item of clothes in a pile of clothes, choosing to spread them out instead. While crowded text was very difficult to read, these behaviors are the adaptive reactions and natural outcomes of impaired visual search due to the posterior parietal lobes not having that map. Many of these were the behaviors that Nicola in the first film heard about and recognized for the very first time as being hers too, and that they were all down to her having the same problem. With time, using his strengths and abilities, he learned to scan the ground ahead, to declutter his bedroom, to mask the text above what he was reading um, so that he would have less to read, better use his hearing and touch and systematically scan his surroundings. And a year later, he showed much greater independence and self-esteem, whilst behavioral outbursts from frustration were much fewer. A recent research project carried out in Bristol um, on uh, school children of uh, studying 1,480 children has shown that 3.4% of children in mainstream school have got this problem. 3.4%. And they're all being diagnosed with behavioral diagnoses when in fact they've actually got a, a specific brain one. And obviously, if one can recognize this problem and take appropriate action, then that makes an enormous difference because it did for this young man and many, many others. Michael aged eight had the same. He explained that he could, couldn't locate where sound was coming from. He liked his new phone because friends called him when he couldn't find them. He has white matter problems around where those red arrows are pointing to um, and uh, around the water spaces in the brain or periventricular white matter dis disorder due to being born prematurely. And he couldn't hear what people said while he was looking at them because there was too much to process. He also didn't know where sound was coming from. And when asked what a kicked ball looked like, he said, well, it disappears for a few feet, but comes back when it's slowed down, of course. He actually used those words. Um, he told me he had dyskinetopsia. It's easier in gold because everything is coming towards me, he said. He also cannot count fingers on a fast moving hand, um, but he can only count them when they move that slowly. So he's, this is a common description for being unable to see fast movement. If one looks at uh, this, how do I make the video work, Glenda? Could you just do that again? Because it's too much to try and it's like rubbing your hat and petting and tummy at the same time. Um, so um, if you watch these brains, 
um because you found the recipe there we are thank you um the um what you'll see is the whole brain white matter connections are taken away and now look at them stripped down to the visual system in a controlled normal person the pathway which i called the dorsal stream at the top that pathway has now been imaged um, by clever magnetic resonance imaging scanning called tractography, whereas the ventral stream is not so bad. And this is what these people have. They have fewer fibers there. Fewer fibers means less ability. So this remarkable video of MRI tractography, which was made by Lofty Merabet and his team in Boston, um, really shows us that uh, the, the ability to handle a lot of data is constrained. Why? Whoops, move on. So in, everyone thinks about airport security channels. Um, the more security channels there are, the shorter the queue, because we, the people, the more channels there are, the more quickly people get into the airport because they are being parallel processed into the airport. It's exactly the same provision. The data is being parallel processed through to consciousness from the occipital parietal area to the front to gain consciousness of what we see. Um, if there's fewer channels, you can see fewer data, less information, and it, everything it, it becomes limited. And, and so you have a visual constriction of only being able to see maybe only one thing at once. So what would this picture look like? Maybe this only the head of this man can be seen clearly. So one item can be seen clearly, like the face of the man on the right. Many affected have a wide gap between their fingers and thumb when reaching, um, or place their hand on top um, to, to collect something, or even beyond it to grasp it and gather it up as natural adaptations and compensations. If you do it for yourself. If I reach for the glass over to there, I can't reach for it with a right gap. I have to gather it up to pick it up. There's my adaptation, because in the more peripheral field, the vision is more blurred. This impaired visual guidance of movement relates to the impaired 3D mental mapping of the scene, as does the impairment of visual search. The I shouldn't have written brown boxes, but this area create, creates for us in real time, non-conscious, 3D mental emulation of our surroundings that guide our movements, giving the detailed visuomotor framework for the 3D emulation of the visual scene in the temporal lobes to be mapped onto. Unlike the occipital lobe scene that relates to the head and eyes, the mapped parietal lobe scene relates to the body. So if somebody has a, a low parietal lesion just there, I've seen them um, sit in a room, and if you ask them to look around, they'll say, um, you're there, but you're not. But if you ask them to move their body, but the, uh, they'll, they'll say, oh, I can see both halves of the audience now. But they don't know they can't see that, um, because that, that, that's called anosognosia, not to know that you do not know. If you've lost a part of the brain, you cannot know that you've lost what you can't see. So in the game Minecraft, the blocks making up the picture are 3D pixels called voxels. So this, in a sense, um, is true for the posterior parietal virtual mental map, which matches our surroundings, and so guides the movement of our hands and feet and bodies. Conceptually, if the voxels are big, going to fewer nerve cells, then movement guided by vision becomes inaccurate. This is called optic ataxia. We believe that optic ataxia may also have a flip side because a number of little children um, uh, who are markedly affected fear and cower from and lash out at approaching people and objects. We, of course, are all self-referenced. We all think that they see as we see, but of course they do not. And so that fear that comes from not being able to map what is coming towards them leads to lashing out. They're not, they're not being naughty. They're doing what comes naturally, protecting themselves. We believe that this likely reflects the impaired 3D mental mapping and have referred to this concept as looming. Now, if I could return to Nicola's video well, 
um, I did explain to you that when she, we were in the audience and she stood on the stage, um, I said to her, would you just look out at the audience? She said, yes. How many people can you see? She said, two. Look away. Look back. How many people do you see now? Two? Are they the same two? Oh, certainly not. Could you find the first two? No, that would be impossible. So her damage had led to her having an inability to see more than one or two things at once called simultanagnosia. She had lived with this for a period of 17 years without understanding it. And once she came to understand it, believe it or not, she came to be able to improve her vision. She came to learn to use this little island of vision because she had previously had a nosagnosia for her condition. She did not know that she could not see more than one thing at once. That might sound absurd, but that was the truth. And that is the truth for those people with this condition. Once you introduce them to this concept, it all starts to make sense and they can start to learn and find their ways around. So I'd like them to just say, vision is also underpinned with layers of other vision. And remarkably, Somebody, people who've had strokes like Melina, but not Melina in this case, many of them are able, despite being totally blind, to recognize the emotion of facial expression of the person they're looking at. It's called effective blind sight. They can actually sit, detect the affect or emotion of the person they're looking at, even though they can't see them because they're not looking at them. It's sort of paradox. So how does that come about? We blink before we see that fly, don't we? We blink before it, way ahead of seeing it. That's because we've got a protective visual system as well that's big in crocodiles and not so big in us. And a newborn baby, as I mentioned, will look at the mother. How can they possibly know to do that? How do they know to find the eyes? That is because it is mediated in the brain stem in the upper midbrain, this non-conscious automatic reflex vision provided by direct pathways for, uh, from our eyes directly to the upper midbrain, which get there faster. Of course, the signals from our eyes take a tenth of a second to get to the visual brain and a tenth of a second to us recognizing it. And therefore, we are living a fifth of a second in the past. And that's why linesmen are always wrong. And... So the, in that context, um, the, this bit of visual brain is working all hard all the time for us and actually is totally non-conscious and protecting us. So we've got layers of different aspects of vision. So to summarize the conscious vision, this was an advert I found in the BMJ years ago, but it, it's very accurate because you've got the little man at the front um, looking through the telescope, passing the information back to the guy at the back in the occipital lobes, who is then categorizing it, and then um, sending it down to the little man at the bottom where he's got his three tubs to actually work out what it is he's looking at in the temporal lobes, and up to the top um, to map the scene to be able to move through it. Now here, I wanted to show you a, a video of Daniel. Oh, it worked this time. And Daniel without a script is rather difficult, but Daniel has two glass eyes. And Daniel can find his way about very, very accurately. And he's a friend of mine. So what he's saying here is um, that blindness for him is trivial. He lost his eyes because he, he had had... Um, tumors in them called retinoblastomas removed at the age of 18 months. So he's not seen from the age of 18 months, but his parents allowed him to play, to explore, to find his way about. And he discovered that if he went, he could work out where things were. He was a human bat. Some of you may have actually listened to the program about Daniel um, on the Radio 4 uh, just recently because it came out recently, and I'll tell you about it shortly, um, called Batman and Ethan. 
And if you want to actually um, learn about this, Batman and Ethan uh, is really worth watching. And also, some of you may have seen Ethan, because Ethan was the young man who won um, the, uh, sorry, the, the uh, na national BBC National Competition uh, of Young Persons Music Award. Um, I've, I've got nominal aphasia, um, so, <laughs> which is not surprising at the moment. Um, but he uh, is just on the television recently, brilliant piano by Chopin. Do you see it, one or two people? Um, so, so he's been teaching this blind boy called Ethan um, and was teaching him how to move around. Now, watch this. That you've seen, Daniel. Now watch the video that you're about to see. Here, so there he is. There is Daniel cycling. Now, wait a minute. He's in the blue. There he is. He's in the light the blue. There he is. And here he is moving. And all of those people are totally blind. Now, here is another boy that's totally blind. And he's going, um, and uh, so that's what the vision is like for him. But there's Daniel teaching this young man who's blind from eye blindness due to damage to his front of the eyes. Oh, and there's me talking about it <laughs> when I was a bit younger. Um, and uh, explaining that the, the vision is in the brain, uh, in that area there, um, to his audience. Um, and that was a scanner that, uh, that, that uh, he went through and I'm going to explain what happened because I referred him to the same team uh, in Canada who did some amazing experimental work on Daniel. So there he is, he's light blue, there he is, cycling. He's got two glass eyes. How does he do that? He got, he's got clackers on his bike. Anyway, um, for the program that was called Batman and Ethan, um, I was invited with my, well, hey, watch this, watch this. He's totally blind. Wow. Um, so, um, and they said again, yeah, there he goes. So, uh, so he says, I hear with my ears. He echolocates. He's like a bat, a dolphin, many other species. We can all potentially do it if we learn it. And even people who've learned it, uh, he's taught people at the age of 12 to echolocate and to cycle freely. Um, so in essence, um, that was that video uh, as scripted. Um, and he's just about to show you a little bit. Um, what he does is he holds hold, hold, holds up that perspex he's holding, and he goes, and you can hear it change as he moves the perspex to and for, forward and backwards. Here we are. He's about to bring it towards himself, and it go, the, the, it, the pitch changes. It goes, it goes. It's the sound that you would hear if you were listening to this video. Um, so I'll move on. And I referred him to the same team, as I said, in London, Ontario, where uh, the, they placed him in an anechoic chamber in which there was a, a solid rod like that. And they asked him to locate it. Um, and then they'd take him out and move it, and then he'd locate it again. And that's the scattergram of the position as he located it. And remarkably, um, the upper scattergram, which is uh, the uh, ability to see with active echolocation, is not as good as having a conversation. When he's having a conversation, the echoes around him create imagery and pictures in his mind. And when the um, Batman and Ethan was being filmed, uh, my son and I, my son's the same age as Ethan, and we were, he, he, it was his birthday, and we were climbing a hill, um, um, and in the distance there was a cliff, and um, Ethan went, wow! And, um, and uh, I was walking with um, Batman, uh, with Daniel, and uh, he said to me, oh, beautiful cliffs over there. I said, you can see the cliffs? Oh, yeah. I said, what do they look like? Well, they stretch from there to there. There's a smooth upper bit, and then there's a bit that there's a shelf, and then just closer, uh, there's a crenellated bit. Exact description. Um, I said, how do you see it? Well, I don't really know. I see it as a picture in my mind. So they put him, they got Daniel to, and again, you can see the film, this film material through Batman and Ethan on the uh, by searching for it. You'll, it'll pick it up straight away on the, online. So 
No. So what happened to Daniel was he suggested an experiment, and that was that he would go around with um, microphones on his ears, and he would go as he walked about. He even walked really um, about without bumping into anything. Um, and they um, recorded his sounds and echoes. They laid him in a very expensive uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner that measures blood flow in the active parts of the brain, the visual brain being very active. And hey presto, when they, when they played him his recordings of what they did was they played the recordings of his sounds and echoes. They then played the recordings of his sounds. They subtracted uh, picture two from picture one, which was the recording of the brain's blood flow to the echoes only. And you can see that um, the, uh, in Daniel's brain, in the top right-hand picture on the left-hand side, and it's, that's the dominant side of the brain that sees more than the left side, Look at it lighting up with no light up whatsoever in a control. Daniel uses occipital lobes to see. Daniel can see very well, thank you very much, with no eyes. So, what is vision? Vision is a construct of mind. A miraculous construct of mind, integrated with all the other senses and using vast quantities of processing within the mind. In a sense, it is a reflection. In a sense, what we are doing is we are creating the image and we are superimposing it upon what we deem to be reality. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. On behalf of the society, I apologize for the AV problems that we've had, but knowing Gordon as I do, um, being such a good communicator, I don't know anybody else who could cope uh, with the situation. So well thank done, you. Gordon. We have our two roving microphones here, and also um, from the ether, so does anybody um, have a question that they'd like to ask? Just before, just before you do, can I ask a question, Gordon, just to set yeah. the ball rolling? What about um, blind musicians, for example, Stevie Wonder? Yes. How do they, is it just feel, or how do they learn where to put their fingers on the keyboard? Isn't that things? amazing? I mean, watching Ethan play, um, in the young people's uh, BBC competition. It's amazing. Um, and the answer is that they reference themselves perfectly. Ethan is a good echolocator. He'll know precisely where the piano is and where he is precisely. Um, so I think we grossly, we, we must never be self-referencing. Um, Daniel described his schooling as well-intentioned structured disempowerment. Thank you. Thanks very much. Is that working? Yep. Um, uh, very good, thank you. Um, two closely related questions. The 3.4% of the Bristol children, yes. you mentioned 1,800 roughly, um, um, 1, yes. Uh, did they all have balance syndrome? No. no. They, the point is that uh, none of them had balance syndrome, right. practically. Um, they had subtle, mild variants of it. Right. They had difficulty processing a lot of information at once. So it was a form thrust, so to speak. Yes. We did a fascinating study in um, Glasgow where we were recruited to study uh, 100 people, uh, people um, in various parts of Scotland um, who had sought adult literacy tuition. 
And part of our evaluation was to um, evaluate why they couldn't see, so why they couldn't read. And so we did in-depth assessment of their vision, including the capacity to handle um, complex visual scenes. Right. Ninety-seven percent. Ninety-seven percent of those people seeking adult literacy tuition had a mild version of balance. And All trend. right. Now the 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 related uh, question about the three point four percent was: what was the major apparent reason for their um, problem? Was it prematurity or what? There's a range of causes. Uh, we teach uh, in medicine. Um, I teach Thin Maiden, traumatic hematologic, infective neoplastic, metabolic, iatrogenic, degenerative, not acquired. Whole range of possibilities. Um, so, for example, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the prematurity is an association or cause low blood sugar at an early stage of development, um, a difficult uh, pregnancy um, or a difficult delivery uh, where the baby goes blue and has to be resuscitated. All of these are typical stories, but in around about, in my experience, around about um, three to four out of 10, you never find the cause. Next question is one, one at the back from Gareth. Um, Phil, Phil, could you just give the, because he can't speak. Are many oh, child we'll psychologists aware of this problem? So, could you repeat that? Are many child psychologists aware of this problem with children and are looking to see whether it's a problem just, with their eyesight rather than attention deficit disorders and such like? Sadly, no, despite enormous efforts on our part. Um, it's not well recognized, but we're working hard on it. Uh, if you're interested in understanding this in children, um, we've made a, a website with about a thousand pages uh, called um, CVI Scotland. And if you just type in CVI Scotland, you can read lots about it. It is curriculum vitae information or cerebral visual impairment. Yeah, I mean, cerebral visual, cerebral visual impairment. Scotland. Charlie Victor Indigo. Charlie Victor Indigo. Yeah. A question from Pat online. Uh, she's asking about the echolocation. Uh, are Daniel and Ethan relying primarily on sounds that they're making themselves, or is it? Uh, the passive sounds they're getting from the environments that are guiding the most. Uh, if you speak to Daniel, who is the person who's been the principal world exponent of this and whose scan has proven that it exists, um, he'll tell you that both uh, are equally important, as is um, uh, long cane training and many, many other uh, attributes. It's just as we all have... Uh, experience of our world through all our senses. Um, echolocation is just one component of a panoply of approaches which he and he, the people he's trained employ. want a t-shirt. If the wind, if the eyes are the windows of the soul, and uh, we look at the, a saint called Saint Cuthbert on the, when he was coming to the end of his life, he, he would live in an environment similar to this, your pictures, but he didn't want to see the beauty of the environment. And he built walls around him uh, to kind of uh, see above, see into, into, into uh, the kind of ascendance, ascendancy. And, uh, I'm just wondering what kind of visual experience was, was this kind of hermit going through uh, at the end of his life? It, was it, a, a, like you're saying, in a scientific way, was it an occipital lobe experience? Or was he actually touching on some kind of light of uh, beyond death? Well, from a, um, uh, you allude to a, a fascinating phenomenon. Those people who have been to Antarctica, where there is nothing but white to see, rapidly find that their minds are well, progressively becoming enhanced into their prior memories, 
And it's the, if, if one considers that 40% of brain activity is visual, but one then eliminates the visual input, then the rich nature of prior knowledge, um, of linguistic knowledge, um, bubbles to the fore because, again, all brains are parallel processes. If you remove all that vision, you have a mind which can be replete with um, the whole elements of soul, body, history, knowledge, with the exclusion of vision. While the microphone. Um... Yes. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're asking for a level of knowledge that's not available to me, but, um, but the, the part of this, of course, is that birds' eyes um, are very variable in nature. Um, the, the type of bird that I'm conscious of is the falcon um, that has a telescope within its eye and can see very, very fine, tiny detail in the far distance, but with a perif wide peripheral vision. And having eyes on both sides of your head, and they, which interact, means that in the center, uh, there is binocular vision, but for the whole surrounding, through 360 degrees and all the way down, they have vision. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the very interesting things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's true for us too. We see our feet when you're walking. I can see my foot now as I look at you, and so I do know where I'm putting my feet. But that is happening automatically. It's that automaticity which is the miracle. They are different. Yes, they are different. I don't know the details of the owl. Is there, Is there a visual defect specifically associated with dyslexia? Non-specifically, yes. Um, dyslexia uh, is defined by psychologists as a disability that is a specific disability in reading, despite having good function in all the other elements that will otherwise enable you to read, like, um, like IQ, et cetera. Um, and therefore it has to be a focal deficit. And the dyslexia has, would be, and I could give it a, 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 at least another hour's lecture, um, because uh, the disability reading um, has many, many forms. There was a, for, for a long time, and there still is, the idea that it is a disability in creating phonemes in the mind, that it is phonetic and not visual. But people are now recognizing that there is a wide range of visual difficulties which uh, preclude or interfere with reading, um, and including the whole, the many of the things that I've been talking about. Uh, but often those are missed because people are not looking. You can only see what you are cognate for, otherwise you miss it. Part of his driver. He's dyslexic. Hmm. He doesn't need to read the driver's car. Absolutely. Um, along with many famous people, including Einstein. What about you snow your eyes now and check the point, the amount of point to the amount? Um, what I was referring to is the effect that this has upon, if one eliminates vast amounts of incoming information, it releases the capacity for thought. Can I ask a question, please? Um, is um, it's a slightly obscure way of looking at it, but 
Um, you know, in America, there's this change of legislation um, re um, removing the woman's automatic rights to abortion. Yeah. Um, and just to say where I'm going, do you think um, that America could be faced with an epidemic of children with visual perception? I don't mean with the majority, but if there are lots more children born prematurely, you know, children that are, let's say, the result of uh, poor attempts at, um, you know, therapeutic abortion at home, um, could we be faced with an even larger, they be faced with an even larger problem? Let me, let me phrase that. That requires a moment's let me, thought. Let, let me <laughs> phrase that slightly for me. It's political, which it wasn't meant to be. But um, when you get children, uh, we do have more and more children rescued from being Absolutely. born premature. And that's why, as I understand it, yes, they would other, they, in the past, they would have passed away. They would not yeah, have survived. There are a lot of children like this who are wonderful survivors, talented, gifted people. Absolutely. But they do have perceptual problems. But they know it to be their norm. They do. But uh, what uh, my question is, um, how, uh, what is your strategy to help children with these subtle and complex defects? That, as a question, <laughs> the, 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 because every individual child with cerebral visual impairment has their own specific, unique pattern of difficulties that nobody else has, my strategy is to do in-depth profiling by in-depth detailed analysis of the history, examination, and careful assessment to find out what each individual child's difficulties are, and then to do our best to um, construct a, a sufficient knowledge and information to uh, enhance parenting of the young child, but also at a later stage to give in-depth feedback to the nature of vision. Because what's fascinating is that, um, as I mean, Daniel has taught me a lot, because he regards um, pe people with blind who, who are blind are accused of having blindisms, of having behaviors which are not quite typical, you know, um, because they're not like mine, you know. Um, and uh, so Daniel has coined the term sightism. The sighted people have got all these terrible behaviors that don't really help people that cannot see. So I think what one actually needs is to stop self-referencing, stop thinking that you are the way that everybody else perceives the world and think that everybody perceives the world differently. And if somebody won't drive through that narrow gap, well, they've got a visual difficulty and they're not stupid, but they see the world in their own normal. And, uh, one memory that I have, Gordon, when I was guided by you, is you impressed me very much by saying that you were more interested in what these kids can do yes. rather than what they can't do. Absolutely. Playing to their strengths. I was very, as you can see, stays with me to this day. Um, any, any more questions? There's a at question the from a gentleman at the back. At the far back, back row. Far back, Phil, behind you. Given the very wide range of um, the, the different uh, symptoms that you're seeing from uh, the, the different problems people are having, is there any way of standardizing testing to find which people might need uh, treatment or um, diagnosis uh, in, individually? Or you know, is, is it anything that could be done uh, for mass screening to try and find people who may need assistance? Potentially, and, and the, the key um, appears to be um, the approach that we've adopted, actually, and that is um, we identified a set of 52 questions uh, which uh, will profile a child's visual difficulty. And uh, since then, um, we, we also found that there were five questions uh, of families that would identify with a high level of specificity and sensitivity the children at risk of uh, cerebral visual impairment who could then be ascertained. 
Uh, so actually structured history taking is emerging. Um, and most recent literature has suggested a set of just eight questions that will specifically identify um, very accurately uh, the uh, children who need to be investigated further. Um, it's by going online and typing in Arvind Chandana to read his paper. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the, the paper I'm talking about was written by a gentleman who's currently in San Francisco by the name of Arvind. Uh, I'll ask me at the end, yeah. yeah. There's another question. Yeah, Phil's there. Oh. Not so much a, a question as a, a comment. Uh, we, we had the good fortune to be referred to you uh, some time ago. I remember very well. And you did two things, which I still recall. One was to visit Kelvindale Primary School to explain to the teachers Indeed. what the problem was, which was tra transformative in terms of their attitude to an impenetrable set of problems. And you also gave us a 12-page report listing a whole lot of visual disabilities, saying this will be useful to you throughout life which it has been. So thank you very much. You're most welcome, thank you. Um, I was just gonna come back to the children. You're saying about the percentage of kids down in Bristol and et cetera. And um, it seems to be that that's going to end up being quite a large number of children. Huge. So it's great to identify it, but what, where do they go? Where do they get the help? How does that happen? big question but um, society it's great finding to... out but absolutely. what do we then do absolutely um that's why i spent the last 12 but well, the last 10 years of retirement actually creating a website but mainly with the help of with the uh, with the drive of a wonderful mum called helen uh, whose son has profound visual difficulties and what was interesting about helen's story um was that uh, she too had been told that her child would never speak. And I said to her, don't forget that the brain processes in time, place and person. Your child can clearly only see one thing at once. And therefore any words that refer to anything your child cannot see uh, will have no meaning and therefore be inaccessible to him. Your child obviously processes very slowly because the electrical signals go through his brain, take a long time to get there and back. And therefore you need to start teaching him by using one word for a single experience at a time. And she started by holding his hand and said, hand, hand. He now, uh, I just got a lovely um, uh, little video of him um, about three years ago, after three years of her very hard work, of him saying, of you, mummy. He'd never spoken till the age of six. But so what I'm getting at is it, we need a sea change in understanding. And what she has done has created um, online, if, if you want to have a look at CVI Scotland, you can actually see me giving 61 lectures, each four minutes long, five minutes long, so uh, on the topic uh, for the layperson. So we're doing our best to disseminate it worldwide. And we know that this information is, has been accessed in 183 countries, and there are only 196, isn't it? So uh, it, it's working. But there's a long, long way to go, a long way to go for professionals to understand the impact of vision and to learn vision. The big problem is that in, in uh, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, the time devoted to vision is only about two hours. It doesn't come out of any of this. It's not there within the undergraduate course. And until it is there, there's not going to be a service that anybody's going to be satisfied with. I think we'll have to. We're, we're, we're out of time now, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're out of time. So, um, but, but drinks will be served afterwards should you wish to come around and have a chat. And if you have any specific questions and you want to take notes or Professor Dutton's email address, um, for a good time, email this address. Um, but I, I'll, just, I'll just wind up uh, by, first of all, thanking you very much and this is a lifetime's interest that we've heard um, explained to us tonight. As you can tell, it's a complex issue. 
And not everybody, especially not ophthalmologists like myself, who think of ourselves as eye mechanics, uh, sort of simplistically speaking, not many people would have the understanding and insight to go into these matters in depth. And, you know, when we are working near to somebody who's doing something pioneering, we don't realize how special it is until it gets recognized by other people. And Gordon has been invited to speak around the world. He's influenced people. They have started special clinics, training people, often with his help, in how to deal with these problematic children who can be helped. And so this was a quiet revolution just in my neighborhood. And we only realized it just about when you were starting to retire. We're all right else. What are we going to do without Gordon? So anyway, it was wonderful because this is a whole new branch of the medical profession in ophthalmology, and it is taking off. It's a long way to go, but it is. So Gordon, thank you very much. You've uh, given us a wonderful evening. You've coped, and I apologize again for the uh, technical problems, and um, you've answered the questions with thought and kindness. So little token from oh. the society for you. Thank you very much. And please thank Gordon.